Hi there, thank you guys for coming today. Um, we're really excited to share our user story with you, uh, a series of unfortunate deployments running a Lambda architecture on OpenStack. Before we get started, we're gonna take a moment to tell you about ourselves. My name is Monica Rodriguez Steinke. I am a lead DevOps engineer at CAS in Columbus, Ohio. So most of my job uh, really consists of shepherding applications and tools throughout the deployment life cycle. Um, as you'll hear today, that often involves a lot of pain and suffering. So um, Chris, why don't you, or Scott, why don't you introduce yourself? So hi, uh, my name is Scott Coplin. I'm a senior technologist at CAS. I've been there for, whew, almost 17 years now, uh, building uh, web-based search and retrieval applications for our customers. Um, let Chris introduce himself now. Hi, my name is Chris Brew. I am a Rackspace dedicated architect working with CAS for about eight months now. Um, in that time, we have pushed the envelope of OpenStack on Liberty, um, done some crazy things, done some awesome things, and as we're about to tell you, done some unfortunate things. <laughs> a little bit about Rackspace. Uh, we, are, we have a global footprint. We're in 150 countries with 12 national, or nationwide, worldwide, excuse me, data centers. Um, we have a portfolio of, of hybrid, dedicated, and pure cloud. Uh, of the 5,800 rackers we call ourselves, about 3,000 of them are support-based. So we are, we are heavily influenced from a support standpoint. And I'll let Scott introduce a little bit about CAS. Yeah, so um, the story we're gonna tell you here, in order to understand it, uh, helps probably to understand who CAS is. So you, you may not have heard of us. Um, what we are is CAS is a division of the American Chemical Society, which is a congressionally chartered nonprofit uh, institution dedicated to the advancement of the chemistry discipline and its practitioners, supporting its practitioners. Um, so in, in that regard, uh, Okay, we are located in also in uh, Columbus, Ohio, right next to the Ohio State University. Any bucks? No, okay. Well, anyway. Um, who we are uh, and what we, that's who we are. Now, what we do, um, so we are technologists, um, scientists, and business leaders, and what we do is we pay attention to the entire world of chemistry. So regardless of where chemical information shows up, be it in journal articles, patents, or basically any other sources, going back nearly 200 years, we've built some very rich databases that capture all that chemistry knowledge. And it's these databases that we use to power the uh, products and services that we offer to uh, chemists, not just in, in the US, but really globally. We are a, a global uh, solution provider. So, we have a variety of products that we offer. Um, the one that we're gonna focus on for this story today is known as SciFinder. Uh, SciFinder is a product aimed at being easy to use for uh, working bench chemists to explore this rich world of chemistry. But before we go specifically in the SciFinder direction, I wanna take a step back and introduce this concept that we alluded to in our subtitle, and it's called it's called, go to the next slide. There we go. It's called the Lambda Architecture. So just quick show of hands, who in the room has heard of the Lambda Architecture? Excellent. So maybe I can go through this uh, fairly quickly, but for those who of you haven't heard of it, uh, this is a term coined first by Nathan Mars, I believe in 2011. Um, and it's a general description of a big data architecture designed to scale technically and also provide an important characteristic called human fault tolerance. Um, and we have a particular variant of the Lambda architecture that we do at CAS, and you'll hear us allude to this acronym in this presentation. I wanna make sure you understand the terminology we're using. We call it our Information Access Platform, or IAP. As any great organ technology organization, we love our acronyms and we attach them to everything. So the IAP, um, conforms to the Lambda architecture for the most part. And I'm gonna to try to go through and describe the various portions and how they map to what we're doing architecturally. So the Lambda architecture first starts with our master data set, what we call our, con excuse me, our content. Now that's that nearly 200 years of rich chemical information that we've uh, gathered using our, our scientists uh, and analysts. Uh, that master data set is then, uh, we call it compilation. This is essentially in the Lambda architecture, the batch layer. Uh, and that's used to produce what we call an IAP index. In the Lambda architecture, this is the batch view. 
key characteristic of this, this is an immutable view of the data designed for serving use cases. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, we use <laughs> next. Uh, we use Hadoop primarily to power this use case. It's not the focus of this story. The, the interesting parts that we talk about come later in the Lambda architecture, where we talk about the serving layer. Now, this is where we load that IAP index, that immutable batch view, into an IAP search engine. And then we use that to answer the customer's queries. So, unsurprisingly, given the venue, we're using OpenStack to power this. Now, we've done this architecture on physical hardware before in, in a cluster computing setting. What's new is that we were bringing it to the OpenStack uh, ecosystem because we needed the power and flexibility to right size our solutions as we uh, build out our portfolio of products. So from here, um, I want to pivot back a little bit to the SciFinder story, the SciFinder problem. So how, how big is this data set that we're dealing with? So one dimension that you can measure that in is in the variety of content that we deal with. This isn't a single type of content. We deal with lots of different kinds, whether it's uh, index concepts, documents, patents, uh, chemical structures and reactions. So all told, though, when we sum that all up, we're loading a search engine of a property graph over 1.1 billion nodes and 11.3 billion relatable edges. Okay, and those aren't just simple nodes. Every one of those usually has something like a uh, Lucene searchable uh, text index associated with it or our own proprietary chemical structure match algorithms. So this is a really big problem. The size of this index that we compute is 7.5 terabytes. And so this is a problem that's too big to realistically be handled on a single machine. So we employ clusters of machines in order to serve that index. Uh, they're connected with high performance 10 gigabit networking. And uh, we have 14.4 terabytes of RAM per cluster that we uh, largely use to load this into. But then we use the rest of the memory and the uh, CPU cores available on that cluster to serve the user's queries using about 1.7 million threads running around, which we employ pipeline parallelism, data parallelism, and task parallelism algorithms. And then we take that whole arrangement and we replicate it multiple times to handle the customer load. So, now, how does this map into the Lambda architecture and OpenStack? We like to call this the scene of the crimes. Well, we have a fairly custom use case. There's some moving parts in the Lambda architecture. And so we started out by implementing our own orchestration. We use Apache JClouds for this. Uh, we had a lot of Java development experience in-house, so this was a natural fit. Um, from there, the first step, in the OpenStack realm, is we allocate some compute uh, nodes and some block storage. So we're making use of Cinder and Nova to do so. And we copy the data from our HDFS, our Hadoop ecosystem, onto that block storage, staging it for use by the online system. We then go ahead and throw away those, hopefully we throw away those compute resources. OK. We throw away those compute resources, return them to the pool. And then from that point, we allocate a high performance cluster for these things connected with a network. We then attach our block storage where we've sharded that digest, sharded that IAP index, uh, and start up our service where it's ready to answer customer queries. So we make use a lot of a lot of different OpenStack technologies here. The first one we're going to focus in on for our story is what happens when the team encounters, oh, drum out, laggard networks. Thank you, Scott. So Scott mentioned our high-level process. Um, we will deploy a cluster, and um, in those clusters, we will stand up an application stack. So through in this application stack, we have many virtual instances. Each of those instances has a number of separate network interfaces attached uh, to support the different functionality of the application. So I have a few expectations when I do this deployment. Um, you know, I expect uh, networks to attach, and um, I expect them to stay there, right, um, forever or until I say differently. 
Um, and I expect the VXLAN, it's the kind that we were using at the time, the VXLANs, I expect them to perform reliably. So this seems reasonable, right? Well, we thought so too, until we tried it. So what did we actually see? Networks were falling from the sky. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this is where your hero, the DevOps engineer, gets the dreaded 3 a.m. phone call for production support. So um, did you know that when you're troubleshooting, checking to see if a network interface is attached is not typically the first thing you look for. It's probably not even in the top 10, right? You just don't expect it. If I go plug a network cable in, close the door, it's locked, it should just stay there, right? So same thing here, but virtual. So, um, you know, what you find here is the monitoring solution that has alerted you in the first place probably doesn't inform you of the actual issue, right? It says, hey, there's something wrong over here, but I actually have to dig through that entire application stack to find what really happened. So here we have at 3 a.m. absolutely looking for a needle in the haystack. So with the networks that actually did hang around, they performed poorly. So you can see from the chart up here that we were only getting about a third of the throughput that we had from our physical environment. So Chris, what was really happening here? Thank you, Monica. I switched. So first, let's do a little background on what a VXLAN is. At its most basic, a VXLAN just means encapsulation. We're taking that, that, that packet and adding an extra header onto it so we can route it through the, the, the various network gear and the computes themselves. So there are two main issues identified with VXLAN networks. The first was that we were not able to use NIC hardware that allowed for VXLAN offloading. This meant that all of the encapsulation and decapsulation had to happen at the CPU or the processor level. That added a huge overhead from just a throughput standpoint. Um, what Monica mentioned is we saw roughly a third of what we'd get from line speed itself. Uh, the second with VXLAN, since we are encapsulating that traffic, the, the address database and the FTB databases have to live somewhere that can be seen from a VXLAN standpoint. This means those live at the compute level and they're replicated across the cloud themselves. So when we were running VXLAN at scale, um, we had m multiple hundreds of computes themselves. Database entries were getting lost. Um, Instances weren't able to ping each other. Corruption was happening across the board and networks would disappear. Um, unfortunately, we, the, to solve this case, we actually just switched to VLAN. Um, it removes that encapsulation layer, lets the switches handle the ARP tables and the address tables, and it gave us the performance that we we're looking for. Not n uh, as fast as line speed as we we're looking for, but we got double of what a VXLAN could give us. So in that case, it was a story of us being unable to work around VXLAN at the scale we wanted it to, and at the, the time that we're using Liberty, by the way. I um, mean, at the time with the Liberty code and the OVS software and what like that. So to solve for this particular instance, we had to remove VXLAN and go to VLAN. So, we had a, a partial success, but also some tragedy with that particular story. The next story that we're going to talk about is what happens when we spin up extremely large compute instances. You remember, our scale of our problem is too big to be solved on one machine alone. We ideally try to scale vertically as far as we can because of distribution costs, so we're talking about very large uh, compute here. Now, that seems like a, a great plan, um, but not everything went exactly as planned when the team encountered murderous kernels. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we are deploying full-size instances. Uh, they're full compute hosts, and we deploy a cluster of them in order to support our application. So um, what we need to happen, what I expect, is to be able to spawn these instances uh, consistently and for them to perform reliably. Um, so we, our, our search engine actually manages its own memory, um, so we want the hypervisor to just stay out of the way so that we can maximize the use of those resources to support our application best. So that all seems pretty reasonable, right? Well, we thought so too, until we tried it. <laughs> so what actually happened? Well, the application performed poorly. So poorly, in fact, that it stopped functioning at all. So what we would see are stuck CPUs in syslog, and we would also have other metrics showing us that CPU was at 100% busy, even though nothing was actually happening on the host. 
Uh, so what would happen for me as the DevOps engineer, the victim, um, you know, <laughs> I have an entire VM that goes into a shutoff state and I have no idea how it got there. So I'm stuck playing whack-a-mole trying to resurrect all these instances. And this went on for weeks at a time. Um, you know, with the simple explanation of OpenStack is unstable, right? We just didn't know what was going on. Um, and as Scott had mentioned earlier, one instance going down, even though we've got a large cluster, um, it does cause the entire application to go down. So we just spent weeks battling constant downtime of this application. So Chris, what was really happening? Thank you, Monica. For murderous kernels, there's a few things that we identified as, as the root causes here. Um, Numera. Uh, memory imbalances. Uh, NUMA means non-uniform memory management. It's a, a newer architecture where memory is allocated to specific regions, and those regions don't apply to the processors themselves. So from um, CAS's standpoint, they wanted to use all of the hypervisor, like they mentioned, everything, all the CPUs, all the memory, they wanted it all for the instance itself. What would then happen is, since we weren't using um, CPU pinning of any kind, the, the, the process from the instance gets floated amongst all of the physical uh, CPUs at the hypervisor level. So we're resulting in some memory imbalances. So the instances getting mysteriously shut off was out of memory killer, going through and saying, I need to protect myself. What is the largest consumer of memory? Instance, kill it, dead. Um, we didn't have any sort of isolation between the instance and the, the uh, hypervisor itself. That was resulting in Nova processes taking too long to, to, to process, to, to do work. Um, networks getting slowed down. All kinds of just general wonkiness in the environment and instabilities itself. Um, without the proper isolation between the two, the hypervisor didn't have enough memory, the instance was running into contention, CPU locks, um, just general, general craziness. So to solve for these, we implemented e uh, CPU isolation and pinning. CPU isolation was done with a grub config that said remove these number of CPUs from the kernel scheduler. Reserve only, basically schedule on the sub small set, reserve the rest for instance allocation itself. Uh, we did that then, um, excuse me, and then we used a CPU pinning to put one virtual CPU dedicated to one physical CPU. This solved for the NUMA imbalances, it solved for the resource contention, and it allowed the hypervisor to have a dedicated set of resources that would not get in the way of the instance, and the instance get not in the way of the hypervisor itself. From a NUMA standpoint, we saw that within their application, they were seeing a bunch of TLB cache misses. This was the way we were trying to allocate huge pages. Um, before, they were using uh, one meg huge pages, and like they mentioned, they're trying to load nine or eight terabytes of data into as much memory as possible so they can search as fast as humanly possible. To solve for this, we, we do pre-allocated one gig huge pages now. That uh, solves for some memory fragmentation, allows the application now to have a properly balanced NUMA region that they can allocate, uh, dynamic, in, uh, excuse me, allocate dynamic memory from within the application. That's what I was trying to say. So from this standpoint, we actually were able to solve for this, the, the instance instability at the hypervisor level. This is the one I think that we've made the most progress on, um, and, and we consider this one a successful journey. Thank you, Chris. I agree, that particular tale was probably the least uh, tragic of the lot that we're here to tell you about today. But I warn you, the next tale we are about to tell you puts all the other ones, all the other tragedies to shame. Uh, and I will also say that for the faint of heart, you may need to leave the room now. As we talk about what happens when we encounter recalcitrant storage. So our data drives our infrastructure and our software. So changes in the uh, amount and the structure of the data require um, different configurations at deployment time. So our overall process here is we deploy a bunch of hosts, and those are those full-size compute hosts. We um, create a bunch of volumes, and we will attach those volumes to those hosts. Whenever the data changes, then we will actually detach those volumes, destroy the volumes, destroy the host, and get a whole new cluster in its place. So um, I have some expectations when I deploy, right, as far as the storage goes. 
I expect to be able to attach these volumes in um, you know, a consistent amount of time. So in our deployment process for one cluster, we are doing uh, 180 API calls to create volumes, 180 more to attach those volumes to compute hosts. Then when we're done with that data, 180 more API calls to detach and then another 180 to destroy and that's just for the volumes. Um, so remember this is just for one cluster, our, our applications now are multiple clusters so you can just take those numbers and multiply upward. So um, you know, my expectations seem pretty reasonable, right? Well we thought so too until we tried it. <laughs> what actually happened? the truly despicable world that we lived in with detaches. So we would have a volume uh, attached request was issued and nothing would happen. We would issue a detach request and it would go into a detaching state and then nothing forever. So it was just never heard from again, right? Um, so this is where I ask you to take a step back and appreciate what we're doing here. So there is a great amount of data being replicated, a large number of instances being created, and there's a ton of work, right? And this takes hours to get through because of the complexity of the data. We're spawning that almost two million processes across that cluster. So every time that we would fail here at one of these attach or detach points, um, you know, it was really ungraceful and very unforgiving. So we would lose um, half a day or an entire day or more until we could actually move forward. So what was um, really happening here? Monica? So this one we were able to track back to three main components. Um, at the OS level, at the OpenStack level, and, that, uh, and, and then at the backend storage vendor level. At the, open, or at the OS level, when Monica was trying to attach and detach, it, it has to make a call to multipath D because we're using iSCSI backed devices from our enterprise grade storage solution that you probably know extremely well, three letter acronym. Um, so what was happening is multipath D was an issue there. OS Brick was Liberty's first attempt to consolidate all of the attach and detach code scattered throughout all the various projects into one shared library. I did mention that was their first attempt at doing this. Um, and then I, I mentioned our, our backend storage API response and, and functionality was severely limited. What we were seeing, multipath D was crashing. That is when Monica was trying to attach or detach. If multipath D does not exist, you're not going to be able to attach or detach anything. Uh, this was happening because the way we are attaching volumes, we're doing one cinder volume has 16 paths within multipath D, and now replicate that nine times because we're attaching nine volumes per instance. It's a lot of numbers, right? Um, so every time we try to detach, we have to go through and unmap 16 different devices from the OS. Enter OS Brick, They're our first attempt at standardizing, attaching and detaching. The code path through OS Brick itself was completely flawed. It was a one and done. Um, if it failed anywhere, it just completely aborted and, and the uh, volume went to air state. Um, what was trying to do though is it has to go through and flush and rescan for every one of those 16 paths, multiplied by nine times was causing multipath D itself to just sig serve and die. Uh, we were able to get around that by writing um, uh, or custom compiling our own version of multipath D that pulled in some fixes from upstream that basically said, don't die. Um, I don't care if you don't finish cleaning up your work, but just please stay around so that when Monica issues her next detach or attach, you're there to do work. Okay. Um, <laughs> that plus moving it under upstart to say, okay, even if you do die, I want Upstart to handle restarting it itself. Um, those got us in a semi-happy state. Multipath D still wasn't cleaning up everything it needed to do, but at least it was around to do some work. Um, enter OS Brick then too. So we've already mentioned that OS Brick itself, the path through the code was, was problematic at best. Um, so we, we designed a custom code patch for the chemical abstracts to allow us to say first, please retry. Don't just one and done. If you fail to find the path or you fail to clean it up, please try one more time and another time and then give up after that. Um, we changed some of the flow so that we're not uh, flushing and then rescanning on every path. Do it once to find all 19 devices you have to do and then loop through those without flushing and rescanning every time. Um, and the third thing we had to do is we unfortunately had to put an artificial pause in between device unmappings to allow the OS to be able to keep up with all the commands we're sending to it. And the third one 
revolves around this um, backend storage device you all probably know extremely well. Its API was probably the most problematic API I've ever seen. It can only handle requests serially. So think of it from a sender standpoint. Monica is saying, I want to detach all of these volumes and I want to do them now. All of those now are requests from within a messaging system. When those requests hit the messaging system, we start a timer. That's the RPC response timeout. If this API can only process one task at a time and we've sent it 180 tasks to do, by the time we got down to 20 or 21 or 22, the messages were dropped, right? The messages are no longer valid because we've hit our response timeout. Enter volumes that are stuck in perpetual detaching state. The API and the backend would still do its cleanup work, but we no longer have a message to map back to say that this is now cleaned up. Put this volume into an available, or available detached state. That one, unfortunately, we're still trying to work through. And to help us, and this is something as an, as an operator and a, an architect I hate to do, we had to go back to developers and say, please help us. Their API can only handle so many requests at once. Please put in some artificial throttling within your JCloud's orchestration layer that says only detach one volume per instance per compute at a time. That got us somewhat closer. Uh, we also raised the, the RPC response timeout to five minutes which is less than ideal um, from, a, from a learning and a monitoring standpoint. That got us about 90% of the way there, and now we're still fighting with the last 10%. So this one, unfortunately, is not solved. We've made some significant progress, but the issue is still around. So let's go ahead and summarize here. So in the network space, what was our problem? We had slow and unstable networks, right? They were falling from the sky. Well, what did we do? We replaced VXLANs with VLANs. And that worked pretty well for us. Um, we did get some of that throughput uh, back, but we're still not quite where we need to be from, compared to our physical environment. How, In, many, how many VXLAN VLANs did you have? What was the number across of Across a given application deployment or? In general, because usually go to VXLAN if you're going over 4096. We've been living in the VLAN space, so we're going to be underneath that. Yeah. For, for a given stack, uh, we're about 100 VMs, and then we end up with about double the number of network interfaces for one stack for one environment. Multiply environments, uh, and then other applications, so just, yeah. Um, in our compute space, what was the issue? We had stuck CPUs and crashing VMs, right? They would go into a shutoff state with no evidence of how they actually got there. Um, so what did we do? We implemented CPU pinning, uh, NUMA alignment, and we also reserved resources for the hypervisor itself. Um, from that, we got stability and performance, and we feel pretty good that uh, the case was solved there. And in our block storage area, we have, uh, we had, have, unfortunately, failure to attach and detach volumes um, at velocity, right? We're trying to do a lot of work, and we wanted to actually be successful and finish in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so what did we do? Well, unfortunately, we implemented throttling, which is, on our side, that's a big Band-Aid. Um, we did have some code patches, so there were some good things that came out of it, but this is still an ongoing issue for us. So, mm -hmm. Scott, what's in our future? Hopefully less tragedy. But there are some, maybe some obvious things that we'd want to look at here going forward. Um, we noted that we still have some uh, network performance and we are a very network intensive application. So taking a look at offering SRIOV on these instances and pinning the network like we've pinned the CPU and memory successfully would be something we'd like to look at. We'd also take a, like to take a look at extending our memory and CPU pinning model to the rest of our cloud. Uh, it's been much very uh, successful in stabilizing our instances, not getting oversubscribed CPUs and memory, and, and that's something we'd like to see elsewhere as well. We'd also like to take a look at different storage solutions altogether. Um, I'll just go back and say, if you were at the keynotes this morning and you were hearing Boris talk about what happens when you take common enterprise solutions and apply them in the cloud space, uh, I think we may exhibit that cautionary tale of, of what can happen when you do that sort of thing. So we try to be more cloudy, maybe look at some uh, different instance storage options here. Obviously, you might be thinking to yourselves, why didn't they just use Ironic? Well, in the version of OpenStack we were in, it wasn't offered on a single control plane. 
Uh, that may be ch changed at this point. Um, so we'd like to probably take another look at that, as well as containers. Uh, we are using Docker uh, throughout a lot of other portions of our architecture, and bringing it into this space would probably be a, a good thing to look at as well. So that said, we'll uh, open it up for questions. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, that is one question. It seems like the application would be more suitable for something like Kubernetes, you know, scale out. But anyway, um, on the networking side, have you considered using um, a non-overlay solution? Obviously, even if you're moving to VLANs, you still have an OVS in the data path that's processing every packet. Uh, have you considered something like Calico, where you have a pure layer three solution without overlays? And essentially, there is nothing in the data path, so you would be getting bare metal performance. So we're doing just straight L2 VLANs, so we don't really have anything that's interpreting like from an OVS standpoint. It's all done by the kernel itself. The question is why? Why? So, so even in the kernel, you have additional uh, overhead. Uh, overhead yep. Versus going with something like uh, using Calico as an example, where you have nothing in the in the data path. That's an excellent question. I guess we haven't really dived into that, we haven't gone down that path, right? So the problem we were trying to solve was an immediate, we have one third of our, our performance of line speed, how can we get better? Um, but, and VLAN was just something that Rackspace provided as, as a reference architecture. Um, but we haven't actually looked at an alternate yeah. solutions to VLAN itself. Yeah, I think those are definitely things mm -hmm. we could consider uh, as we're looking to wring more out of our network as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. What, uh, what kernel, and if you can say what distro are you using that uh, you've ran into these uh, uh, new scheduling issues? It was Ubuntu 14.04, LTS. Okay, but are you using, which, are you using the 4.04 kernel or the 13.04 kernel? It was the 3.18 3 kernel 18. at the time. Okay. What is that again? Which paper was it on? Is it again? So the question is, which hypervisor are we using? Fra like. Uh, KVM? Yeah, okay. I thought you meant like physical gear. No, but we use KVM. Mm -hmm. I have the same question, but for the multipath. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that has been fixed upstream, by the way. Um, they were able to pull in, a, it's not version five, it's the one right below it. That fixes the SIG serve. Um, we just happened to run in it at the, at the same time that the bugs were being filed. Yeah. Uh, so I got a question concerning the um, memory reservation that you do because we had some very similar issues and we also solved them in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. So my first question is like how much memory do we reserve actually for the hypervisor, so much, how much overhead do we have? We reserve eight gig. It's a little aggressive from our, from our standpoint. We could probably get by with four, um, but the, by default it only reserved two gig. Okay, but eight gigs is per, so how big is the machine? What it's fraction is that? 768 gigs total. Okay, that's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a have fairly like, low overhead. We have eight gigabytes on 128 yeah. gigabyte machines, and mm -hmm. I also feel that this is a little bit conservative. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's much more conservative. The second question is about um, Cinder or like volume detachments, because what we observe is that when we detach a large number of volumes, for instance, from, uh, I don't know, uh, Kubernetes clusters, where then suddenly there's a bunch of um, volume deletions, we see races in the, um, the, in the quota mm -hmm. and reservation um, uh, commits, mm -hmm. which then lead to the timeouts that you described. Have you seen this as well? We've not seen anything from a scheduling standpoint. We've been able to track this fairly certainly back to the slow API response time we're getting from our backend storage device. I think, yep. I think you may be foreshadowing our next series of <laughs> tragedies here as soon as we get past that particular bottleneck. Thanks. Over here. Um, just two quick questions. Uh, what ML2 plugin are you guys running? And um, uh, what are you still on Liberty? Or are you moving forward? Or? We're still on Liberty. We have a Newton develop, uh, dev cloud where we're deploying right now to test all the changes. And I'm not sure of the ML2 plugin. Linux Bridge. Linux Bridge. Thank you, James. <laughs> James is my rackers. network guy. He's my, he's yeah. my fantastic go-to guy in the back there. Hi, uh, networking question. So your network is layer two, right? So my question is, uh, which protocol is the network running? Is it a uh, trail or, you know, so that it's not a spanning tree, right? So you mentioned that you're, <coughs> you're only 66% utilized. I wonder, yeah, what's the network protocol that is driving the layer two? Um, so the, the benchmarks that we took 
that we quoted. I, the, the question was, what protocol are we, are we driving there? Um, the application itself just uses TCP sockets um, and uh, some fairly large packet sizes as well. Um, but the benchmarks that we quoted was uh, NetPerf TCP RR, TCP round robin, um, that we used to just get a, a baseline benchmarking for comparison. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Right. It's, it's really the protocol that, that you know, it's the, that give you the data part in the network. Is it a spanning tree protocol or a multi spanning tree protocol trail or maybe it's something yeah. that? So, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're, you're probably asking something that's uh, diving more into our, our um, physical networks and unfortunately we're not well represented there. Mm -hmm. um, we are using um, uh, some, uh, a networking technology that actually gives us uh, a flat latency without, we're not using a top of rack switch architecture um, and it gives us sort of a flat latency throughout our data center. So. So uh, we haven't had a whole lot of, uh, that hasn't been the source of the performance problems. It's been more the um, on-host architecture that, that's, I think, we, we've sort of feel that that's where the bottlenecks are coming in. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for a good session. Um, did, for your compute nodes, did you consider using Noble XD uh, as an alternative to KVM? So that is, uh, yes, uh, but that is more of the next step like, yeah. can we use containers? Can we use Ironic? Can we do something beyond mm -hmm. KVM? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, because I, I think you can definitely get a performance improvement without the hypervisor overhead. But mm -hmm. nice thing about that versus bare metal is you get so much more flexibility because, you know. Well, that was one yeah, of the things when we started looking at this. There was so many deficiency within Ironic itself. It's like we generated a poor man's Ironic under, under Nova itself. Yeah. Um, the, the shared networks, the multi-tenant networks, the single control plane. All the things that we needed to make this happen weren't available yet. Okay. But yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When we introduced um, huge pages and CPU pinning, we did this mostly or only basically for performance reasons because mm -hmm. we saw there's a clear difference between what we get out of the virtual machine compared to what we get out of the physical machine. Mm -hmm. Did you compare your virtual machines with physical hardware and uh, performance wise? What's the difference or what's the loss, the overhead that you have with your? virtual machines now that they run with, mm -hmm. with huge pages and CPU pinning? Uh, yeah, so um, regarding the uh, performance change with CPU pinning and huge pages, um, honestly, given the scale of our application, uh, it was, we, we didn't have to benchmark it. It was either it works or it didn't. Um, the, uh, we run our, we can run our CPUs extremely hot when a, when a uh, customer request is in. And that was causing, as we mentioned, the, the CPU lockups to the point where it just wasn't making progress. And because we employ uh, data parallel algorithms, if one of those locks up, it basically slows down the entire request. Um, and then from uh, the memory <coughs> standpoint, um, you know, really you know, the situation was um, because we weren't NUMA aware within, we weren't being NUMA aware in our scheduling, uh, it led to host level imbalances and you could look on the host and say, hey, this thing has free memory. And then you look in the syslog and see umkiller killed your instance and you're like, what the heck? Well, it kicks in even when one NUMA region fills up. Even if the host has room, if one NUMA region fills up, right. then that's th that, yeah. So uh, back to your question, yeah, the baseline was really just, is it even working for us? Um, you know, uh, because we run so hot, memory and CPU oversubscription is likely not going to be very good for us in general, so we've sort of taken it on that. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. The, um, we didn't dare to run with one gigabyte huge pages, so mm -hmm. the, the benchmarking that I've done is like we, we moved to two megabytes, okay. and one gigabyte was even better, but it felt like a like very large. Have you experienced any issue with these large huge pages or is it just working as like two megabytes of 4K would work as well? Because we would like to, I mean, the further we reduce the yeah. uh, page table translation, the better okay. for, for our application. This is why we went to larger huge pages. But one gigabyte felt like very big. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess um, regarding the page sizes, just to be clear, uh, we allocated the pre-allocated huge pages at the uh, host level. Yes. 
uh, within within the guest op so we, we use those huge pages yeah, then so to back we, the yeah, yeah. okay so right uh, so we haven't we haven't citation. you know uh, experimented too much in terms of that but if we look at our our broader cloud this is a strategy that we're we're using currently just in these very large compute instances um, we may extend it to the other ones but pretty much every VM we have is an increment of a gigabyte. We don't have anything smaller. So the, the fragmentation or other disadvantages with the, the gigabyte huge pages, we don't see a whole lot of uh, disadvantages okay. with that. Plus the one gig huge pages more modeled your data, your data model itself. They have a lot of sure. data they want to load into RAM. Yeah. Um, we did see TLB cache misses go down when we did one gig huge pages. I mean, yeah. of course, right? Because you have a whole bunch more RAM in there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how many instances you are starting destroying like per day? So this, uh, Monica, that'd be from your, your testing standpoint. When, when we were going through the initial testing, finding all of these problems, mm -hmm. it was a stand up a whole cluster and then try and tear it down multiple times a day. Um, so. Right, so we were using those, uh, so a cluster, we did experiment with different sizes, but for the most part it was 20 instances, so 20 hosts, and then we would have eight or nine volumes attached uh, per host, so there you get the 180 volumes, but as far as the instances, yeah, I mean, we would try and, and create them and, you know, stand them up and tear down, and we would make a dozen attempts in a day, you know, in under eight hours, um, and using, you know, um, uh, we had to manually intervene to actually correct things, right, to keep it going or to call Rackspace and say, hey, I've got a bunch of volumes in an error state, you know, can you help me Again. out here? Again, yes, it was constant. <laughs> um, and we really could not uh, move forward with that. So we had just constant all hands on deck trying to get through, um, you know, resolving these issues. And for us, this was um, a very popular product and it was a big deal and everyone was really watching it, right? So we had due dates and we had to make it and it was very well known for the entire company mm -hmm. about it. So to continue to have these failures was really evident to our internal customers, um, you know, but ultimately our external customers as well. The people, we did have beta, um, beta users out there testing it and it would impact them, um, you know, trying to deliver some kind of updates or just have an online application. So. Yeah, these issues did, uh, did, did a lot for eroding the confidence of OpenStack. Mm -hmm. um, it was the instability, the unreliability of it, and we've gotten a lot better at, at giving a stable platform. Yeah. We just need to go that last, you know, last half mile. So, okay. so maybe just jumping back to your, your question, how often are we trying to do it versus mm -hmm. how much are we? How, uh, how yeah. many instances? Right, how many instances per day? So we have a cluster size. Um, right now it's, it's replicated to two clusters. Mm -hmm. But then on a, on a daily basis, the design being based on the, the Lambda architecture where we're essentially replacing that, that serving layer, uh, we'd like to do it on a daily basis. Right. Um, we are nowhere near that primarily because of all the, <laughs> the attach and detach issues that we've seen along the way. So we're still making progress on that, but. Um, so from the yeah. end goal would be 30 instances a day would be spun up and spun down, but during testing it was hundreds right. per right. day. Okay, yeah. and uh, so you did not uh, face the issues with Nova Scheduler, right? No. No, okay, no. and uh, uh, as far as I understood, you faced issues with the cinder volume, right? Correct. Uh, and the slow messaging bus. Right. Yeah, it was the, the API of our back, our enterprise storage solution was not up to snuff, basically. We couldn't handle the work we were trying to throw at it. Oh, so, uh, so the bottleneck was the API of the storage backend? Yes, ah. exactly. Yes. Okay, so not the messaging bus. No. Ah. No. no, that was a vic yet another victim. The mes yeah, the messaging bus was a victim because if we would say detach these 20 volumes, yeah. Yeah. we start a timer, and if it could only get to 15 before our timer's out, we have five volumes stuck in perpetual okay. detaching. Thanks for the cool story. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you guys so much for coming today. Cool. That's it. All right. Cool. Nice job.